now my pleasure to introduce uh, the moderator for our panel, uh, Lieutenant General John R. Wood, U.S. Army, retired, uh, is a former commander of the Joint Forces Command and has a special relationship to this conference because as the Deputy Commander at Joint Forces Command, uh, when they were co-sponsoring this event, he was very much uh, involved in the development of the program and uh, keeping us straight as we put the program together. So, Bob, we thank you for that. And so if I, if I could ask the entire panel to come up. So I'm going to uh, introduce General Wood, and then he will introduce uh, his panelists. Uh, the title of this uh, presentation is Joint and Coalition Operations, What is the Way Ahead? And I think uh, we have the perfect panel to address that issue. Uh, General Wood served over 36 years in, in the U.S. Army and served in many roles, commanding at every level, including uh, Commanding General's 2nd Infantry Division, Director of Army Strategic Plans and Policy, and the Director of Joint Experimentation for the U.S. Forces Command, in addition to, as I mentioned earlier, becoming uh, the Deputy Commander there. Uh, he served as the U.S. Army's Strategic Planner in developing and implementing the Army's response for combating terrorism after 9-11. And since retiring in January of 2009, Lieutenant General Wood has started his, uh, his own company, Star Strategies Group, LLC. So please give him a warm U.S. Naval Institute and AFC a welcome to Lieutenant General Bob Wood. Ken, thank you very much. Uh, it's always great to be back with AFCA, back in Tidewater, and really back with all of you. It's, uh, it's really a collection of associates and friends and uh, teammates uh, from uh, years that I was here. It's always good to come back and uh, get a little bit of good seafood. And uh, I tried some for some sunshine, but failed today. But uh, we are, in fact, blessed today to have a wonderful panel, a great topic, and probably the right time uh, to talk about this topic. Uh, the panel consists of uh, four distinguished gentlemen who have a, a varied background. And uh, as much as we are going to talk about the Joint Coalition Operations and the way ahead, I find that the topic of the uh, overall conference is useful and important. That is the Joint Forces inflection point, what to hold and what to fold. It is an inflection point for us, uh, a time of change, a time in which we're facing a variety of pressures. But it's not really much different than uh, times we've seen in the past. So before I, uh, I introduce the panel, I thought I'd just set the stage a little bit because they all have some, uh, uh, some uh, good things to present and then at the end questions to answer from you. It really does uh, uh, seem that we are at another inflection point, but it's not unusual that we, uh, that we are. It's May, uh, spring is coming or spring is among, uh, on us, summer's ahead and uh, the budget season is playing out. No different than we've seen in the past other times in our history in which we've approached an inflection point at the conclusion or the begin of war. I think back to uh, uh, thoughts uh, turn to uh, some history, of course, after talking last night to Bob Scales, who will be uh, the moderator of the next panel, great historian. I always ask him the question, Bob, what are you writing? Because he's always writing a new book. And this book was about the cyclical uh, manner of our military history. And I won't give away any of the punchlines, but it did get me thinking about the pattern of history and the cycles that we live in. And we're once again seeing the result of an 11-year cycle of war. But frankly, that 11-year got me going, and I started to think. Neville Chamberlain in 1938 said, peace in our time. A year later, 1939, the Nazis invaded Germany, uh, invaded Poland, and we were at war in World War II. That was 39. 11 years later, it's 1950. 1950 in July, North Korea invaded South Korea. 11 years after that, 1950 to 1961, in August of 1961, the Berlin Wall went up. 
essentially uh, capturing the Cold War in uh, concrete form. We all lived through that. We made it through it. Paris Peace Accords were signed about 12 years later, 1973, an inflection point for many of us who are here in the crowd today. Change in the way we thought about uh, our profession and the way we thought about, uh, frankly, our future in many cases. And I tried to keep that pattern going, and I went 11 years after that, really 12, and I got to 1984, and I said, my gosh, what happened then? What was the inflection point there? Well, Army did beat Navy that year, and that was a, certainly a, a point of celebration. Uh, it doesn't happen often enough, but anyway, it happened. Really, the pattern picked back up in November 1989, always that like late summer, early for, uh, fourth quarter, and the Berlin Wall fell in 9 November 1989. And that was certainly an inflection point for all of us as the Cold War ended and we faced kind of a new future. 11 years after 1989, close to it, was September 11, 2001. A remarkable point in time, a point in time in which I remember sitting in the Pentagon as the Director of Strategy and Plans and reading the final draft version of uh, the QDR in which we thought we had the world all captured in a nice, uh, nice tome and in fact, uh, we thought we really uh, were going to downsize uh, into our future. Of course, as I sat reading that, quite literally, a plane flew into my window. Uh, changed my life, changed our lives. 9-11 certainly did. 12 years from 9-11 is now. Uh, correction, 11 years. Now, today, it's May. We're reflecting on a beautiful spring and what's to come. And what may come this fall? Well, I don't know whether it'll be a military event or it'll be a budget event. Sequestration is out there and pending whether or not we choose to plan for it or not. And the future that these gentlemen on this, on this stage face in May, when we like to reflect large thoughts and think about wonderful futures, we always have that budget, that budget impact coming at us. And certainly sequestration faces all of us as we think about the impact of going beyond the $487 billion cut that is already on the table and think more about the $890 billion cut that could spread out for the next 10 years. All of these gentlemen up here are distinguished strategists in their background, but they're also remarkable commanders, experienced in the battles we fought in the, in the recent years and the battles we fought uh, throughout their careers. They all are thinking about what is to come in operations, both joint and coalition. Our first speaker will be uh, General Flynn, our J-7 of the Joint Staff, General Flynn, uh, has a distinguished background, uh, starting, of course, as a field artilleryman. Your, the bio is available to you. I would simply point out that through command and staff, force development and training assignments, he is exactly the right man in the right position as J-7 Director for Joint Force Development. Our next speaker will be Lieutenant General Keith Walker. He, too, uh, has seen policy and strategy over time. Great background as an armor officer, remarkable command tours, and in the last two commands he had, he looked at the brigade modernization uh, for our Army, and then most recently, and in his current position, he's the Deputy Commanding General for Futures, Director of Army Capabilities Integration Center at TRADOC. Third speaker will be Rear Admiral Phil Davidson, 1982 graduate, the Naval Academy, multiple deployments, commander of carrier strike groups, commanders of a, a variety of uh, ships in our, in our Navy, uh, has, in fact, great experience as a strategic planner at the uh, J-5 level, the Navy staff, Pacific Fleet, uh, and even a, a tour uh, in the Vice President's office. He is currently the Director for Global Force Management, Operations, and Intelligence, U F U.S. Fleet Forces Command, and most, most of you know him in that role today here who are in the room. Our final speaker will be Vice Admiral Tony Johnston Burt, commissioned in 1977, a Naval officer from the United Kingdom, a set of commands all the way from the Falkland Islands through and to the Iraq and Afghanistan fight in which he was the commander joint helicopter command supplying aircraft for forces for the UK and frankly for the coalition in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, he now is chief of staff North Atlantic Treaty Organization Allied Command Transformation. So four speakers, all of them in May peacefully thinking about the future but in fact today to reflect for you what they see as the future and the way ahead for our joint and coalition force. I'd like to introduce, introduce first Lieutenant General George Flynn, just give, him, give you his thoughts first. Well, it's a pleasure being here when I first got the invitation from uh, Admiral Pete Daly 
Uh, the last time I did this was in San Diego. It was sunny. It was 80 degrees. It was a typical San Diego day. So you didn't, you didn't do me well on the weather this time. So, uh, But I also understand that we've got about uh, 10 to 12 minutes here to, 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 to uh, cover this topic. And what I'm going to talk to you about in 10 to 12 minutes is my tasking is to present uh, the context for the changes that are and will be taking place in joint and coalition operations from a joint force commander's perspective. So put the clock on now. Here we go. As uh, General Woods mentioned, I do believe, and I agree with him, we're at the, we are at an operational capability inflection point that ranks in significance to maybe two like events, the introduction of the airplane and, uh, and, and what that meant to our warfighting capability, and maybe you could compare it to when the carrier replaced the, the battleship as the, has the capital ship of the Navy. In order to accomplish the tasking, I got two things I want to talk to you about today. First is understanding the environment that we're likely to operate in the future. And the other thing is to, to give you uh, some insights into what we're doing right now as we develop the new capstone concept for joint operations. I like to say about the environment that if you like the complexity, the uncertainty, and the increasing danger of today, you're really going to like tomorrow. Uh, because nothing is really going to change. The world is going to remain complex, uncertain, and it's going to be increasingly dangerous. But there are two things that are going to change. First of all, we have a new fiscal reality. Nobody is writing us more checks. When I go to work in the morning, nobody says, here's some more money, see what you can do with it. Everybody says, what can you do with, uh, with less money and can you, deliver on the same, uh, can you deliver the same way? The other change that's occurring is uh, the speed of change. Things are happening, fa happening faster. Change is happening faster. And we're going to have to op learn to operate at the speed of the environment. So let's talk about that change for a minute. The Cold War lasted 42 years. It was an evolutionary event characterized by deliberate change. The world was connected, but it was characterized by very deliberate change in our connectivity, and there was a chance to understand the context all the time. All right, so that was the Cold War. And our strategy at the time, and what we hoped to do, was we hoped to be able to control events. In contrast, when you take a look at the recent event that occurred called the Arab Spring, that took the Arab world in about three to four months time. Uh, this was revolutionary, and it caused us to have reactive change. Through the hyper-connective world, the media environment, word of, word of these events spread almost instantaneously. And our strategy at best was to hope to influence the events in the way the world would change. Individual connectivity has grown rapidly since 1946, when only a handful of bulky mobile phones were available. In fact, the network could only handle 25 calls at a time. Today, most everyone has full internet, video call access in their pocket with near universal coverage. Costs related to defense have also changed significantly. The Jeep in World War II, when we first procured it, cost about $700 a vehicle. If you, if you take that out and you take a look at the numbers that we bought, it was, it was pretty inexpensive. If you take that Jeep of 1941, in today's dollars, it would cost about $10,000 a vehicle. All right? The Humvee, when we first bought it, cost about uh, $60,000, $60,000. Uh, the replacement in, today, in today's dollars, probably about $130,000. If you take a look at the vehicles we're looking at replacing that, you're looking at about $300,000 a vehicle. That's kind of where it's at last time I checked. The same increase in cost are also taking place on the battlefield with our individual servicemen and women. A World War II infantryman cost a little over $2,000 in today's dollars to, to uh, equip the GI of World War II. Most of that was the M1 rifle, which cost about $800 in, in, those, in those types of uh, 1941 dollars because the M1 as a semi-automatic rifle was game-changing at the time. Uh, today, the cost is nearly $20,000 a soldier and Marine. Tomorrow's fighters, although they'll be increasingly capable, will cost us about $30,000 to $60,000 to kit out. All right? So there's your, there's your issue about cost. The future operating environment, both the technology and the threat will ever increase at greater rates of change. And a large, of that, a large portion of that is going to be due to the availability of information, the amount of, uh, of information available, and the accessibility of information. 
Our previous advantage and capability will narrow with the proliferation of technology. In many ways, technology has been democratized. Years ago, we could have spent billions of dollars on a research and development program and had us an operational advantage for years. That same investment today could have, just because of the availability of technology or the pieces of technology that are available on the net, you could spend billions of dollars and have that advantage, maybe only for days, maybe months, before somebody else uh, understands the technology. The greater availability of information will also empower threat forces, both conventional and, and also uh, non, non-traditional state actors. Now, I don't want to give you the wrong impression about me, but a couple of, a couple of months ago, I was reading the Harvard Business Review. All right? I don't want to set any expectations here. I've only read that magazine once in my life, all right? And that was a couple of months ago. And there was an, there was an article in there that talked about what, what, what business could learn from organized crime. And that kind of got my attention, so I, I read it. And what it talked about, it talked about the Mumbai terrorist attack, all right? The, the, uh, all the mission planning was done via Google Earth. Right? There was no investment in technology and ISR platforms or anything like that. You could just go to the, to the net, go to Google Earth. You could do your, your mission planning. You could come up with your ingress routes. You could come up with uh, your plan to execute the mission. All the command and control was done over, the, over a, a cellular phone network. That's, that's all you needed. And when the attack was going on and Indian uh, commandos were fast roping down to the ho top of the hotel, a bystander took a picture of that and tweeted or posted it somewhere on the net. Instantaneously, that information was transmitted to the terrorists inside the hotel and they ambushed the commandos on the way in. All right? How much technology or how much investment was made to create that terrorist capability? And if you, and again, that was in the uh, fall issue of uh, the Harvard Business Review. The other thing that's going to change our world and why we're at an inflection point is that cyber is a new domain. And it offers both uh, symmetric and also asymmetrical advantages and also vulnerabilities. Space and cyber will continue to place an increased role in events with each becoming increasing contested domains. So it's a new domain that we're going to have to contest. Security challenges will have both local and global aspects with link events occurring across the globe. Fiscal constraints will lead to both difficult decisions and the need for prioritization. Anti-access, anti-denial threats increasing will become more difficult to overcome. And remember now, in every sense of the word, the homeland is now part of the battle space. Uh, the other part is technology, which used to be our advantage, could also become a critical vulnerability or our disadvantage. The battle space of the past was linear with clear definition through physical boundaries. Coordination was easy. Future battle space will be nonlinear and multidimensional. Space and cyber now join air, sea, and land as contested domains. And we will seek to get advantage in each domain in, in space and time. Joint forces will operate within and across domains. Our decision cycle or process must keep pace with the accelerated challenge. We must rapidly gain a common understanding of the problem, take action, and anticipate rapidly second and third order effects. All the while, we must be prepared for the black swan or the unanticipated event. So what are we doing about it? That's the environment. What we're doing about it is we're taking a look and, and hopefully we'll have it published this summer as the new capstone concept for joint operations. It's the chairman's intent that this document be the bridge uh, from the strategy that was recently published to the development of operational capability. The operational challenge is to decide how will the future joint forces with constrained resources protect U.S. national interests against increasingly capable enemies in an uncertain, complex, and rapidly changing world when security challenges simultaneously exhibit both local and global dimensions? That's the homework assignment I was given by the chairman. So if you got any help for me, I'm, I'm all, all ears here. The capstone concept will frame the problem for, pro, pro, for proposed solutions. So here's what we're looking at. We're looking at the global, functional, and regional command structure. We're going to look at the seams, and we're going to see what we need to be doing different. We're going to make sure that commanders have the authorities necessary to match the speed of operational requirements and the employment of the capabilities that they have. We're going to try to achieve cross-domain synergy in both, in both space and time. 
We're also going to take a look at traditional supported supporting relationships to see what we need to do to change. And we're going to have to look at increased interdependence and interoperability across the joint force. We're going to also have to deal with the fact that the force is going to be distributed more across the battlefield. And we're also going to have to take a look at how we command and control the force and how do we develop the leaders needed to execute this force. The intent that we're working through is to be able to, to achieve globally integrated operations. The heart of this is going to be mission command, what we used to call command and control. The human element is at the heart of our ability to be able to do this. And if we're going to be able to operate at the speed of the environment and make the decisions that we're going to have to make in time, we're going to have to develop the trust and we're going to have to empower power leaders uh, uh, to be able to do this. And it's going to be enabled by a global collaborative, um, globally collaborative tool enabled uh, network that is empowered by the cloud. Now, I can explain that later, but I had to say that out to Mike Warlick so he could think I was actually smart here. Uh, the other part is to take a look at some other war fighting functions. On the mobility piece, you know, we have a smaller force. So a key ability is going to be able to have the force to have the mobility to make sure that we're rapidly able to shift our forces around the world. It's easy to move people, it's hard to move equipment. So one of the things we may have to take a look at is how do, our, how do we move that equipment? Do we preposition or, or, or what? On fires, we have to not only think of fires in a traditional kinetic piece, we also have to take a look at cyber fires and how do you integrate them to achieve effects across multiple domains. On the logistics aspects, we have to look at how we deploy and support the force. We have to take a look at how we do contracting. We have to take a look at our ACRC mix. And we also have to take a look at our use of energy. On the intelligence side, we have to have the ability to co-create context. And on force protection side, we have to be able to protect our network. And we also have to look for a game-changing capability, which potentially could be if we could move to the right of the boom in an IED, and we, and we could actually uh, figure out a way to, to pre-detonate uh, explosives on the battlefield. The risk, there's always risk when you do a capability, and, and I'll, I'll close out here in a minute. First of all, a risk is B, if we don't have the ability to communicate amongst ourselves, that the network fails. The second risk is if our partners are not able to join the network. Another risk is that our pursuit of advanced technology proves to be unaffordable. Uh, and another thing is because of the capability of our nets, we are tempted into ever greater centralization, which will actually be the antithesis of mission command. The other part is, another risk is that a smaller force won't be able to meet the security demands and that our growth or our movement towards greater interdependence within the joint force results in less flexibility. So, the bottom line, if you like the past challenges of the past 11 years, you will like the future. The challenges will continue, but the pace will, will continue. As the democratization of technology closes the gap in our advantage and capabilities, we must change to adapt to the emerging threat environment. We will likely not get the future 100% right. We can't afford to be 100% wrong. And thank you for listening to me today. It is on. Okay, you got it. A, a timely topic for somebody. Um, I, I live in a world of concepts and capabilities right now in my role in training and doctrine command. And um, you know, after all, a concept is nothing more than a you know articulation of what the problem is, and then a hip hypothesis on how we would how we would figure out how to solve that problem. And um, so it's you know as as we look at Joint Force 2020, our, it's it's not too in. in coincidental that the Army is looking at Army 2020 and, and how we get after the implications for the Army, the Joint Force, and our coalition partners. Um, you know, I think the start point in our look at concepts, of course, is, um, is strategy. And uh, strategy does matter. It does drive our concepts. And recently, we've got uh, in our defense planning guidance 10 pretty specific missions for our military. Um, you know, but there's environmental factors that affect our concepts too. So although, to paraphrase Winston Churchill, who said that uh, 
you know, this strategy is kind of important, but results really matter. Um, he's also the guy that said, hey, gentlemen, we're out of money. It's time to think. And, um, and your army is thinking very hard in, in our way ahead. So um, as, as our chief of staff, General Ray Odierno, looks at the 10 different missions that the Department of Defense has given us, and these stretch, you know, it's everywhere from humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, to being able to def deter and defeat adversaries. Um, his vision that he frames what we have to do is to prevent, shape, and win. Uh, prevention uh, incorporates the deterrence factor. Shape, our Army Service Component Commanders uh, around the world would, would say that's what they do every day, uh, working with their partners in their regions in support of their uh, geographic combatant commanders. And to win, because you're not going to shape or prevent anything if you don't have the ability to, to win. So I, I think the way our chief has kind of captured that vision to execute the strategic guidance is, is, um, is simple and it's helpful in our, as we look at our concepts. Um, so given that strategic guidance we have, then if we look at the environment, and George talked a bit about the environment, um, the Army's approach to this is that we have what we call a campaign of learning, which is nothing more than a series of studies, war games, experiments, um, seminars, you know, where we try to look at ourselves. So when we, when we do some of these seminars, for example, we, we try to invite, or we do invite, um, academia, uh, think tanks, uh, our joint and coalition partners, uh, try to avoid a bunch of Army guys and gals sitting around the room looking in the mirror at each other, which is not very helpful. But we led off this year's campaign of learning last fall to look at a, um, the topic was alternative futures. And, and I just wanted to talk about the, to reinforce the environment, the four big things I remember from, from a week's worth of, of pretty good dialogue um, on what the alternative futures might look like. And, and by the way, this was not to predict the future. We, we know we're very bad at predicting the future. But the idea was to talk about the future to make sure we didn't get it completely wrong as we thought through our concept work. Um, but the economy uh, was one of the top four. Um, and we had some real economists in the room, which was kind of scary, and, and their notion that the economy may be very rough through 2020, um, and, and only then would start to get better. So that, that concerned me. The shift to the Pacific was also universally, uh, in the four groups that we did, was brought up uh, for, um, as central to our concept work. Um, the Arab Spring, the discussion we had that, that I recall is the Arab Spring may just likely be the gift that keeps on giving when we talk about uncertainty and implications for our uh, joint coalition force. And then uh, cyber, the impact of cyber that not only we were already feeling you know, today, but how that might develop into the future. Uh, you know, obviously lots of other stuff about the future, but those were the big four pieces of the overall environment. So we've got the strategic guidance, we've got you know, we've got the environment, then we can set about, you know, looking at our own concept work, you know, in, in our case, what the Army must do, how the Army operates, et cetera. Um, but there's a linkage, of course, into our, our uh, joint operations. And, and those mission sets that we have, um, I'll just talk about one to, to make that linkage in uh, joint force. Uh, the mission sets that we have do require us to do to overcome the anti-access area denial challenge, you know, should we have to do some type of forced entry operations, which is, you know, of course, pretty difficult. This is not new. We've struggled this for years. We've worked out with our brothers and sisters in the various services and coalition partners how we would do uh, entry operations, uh, what capabilities we would need. So how might that look in the future in this new environment? Uh, you know, certainly you have, um, you know, and we, when I think about our current concept work, we've got the joint operational access concept. The Air Force and Navy have, have developed uh, our air-sea battle concept, which, uh, which addresses that anti-access piece. It addresses a lot more than that, but it does address the anti-access piece of the challenge. But the area denial piece, how do you overcome that? And so when we think about what might the potential threat do, what might that potential threat look like in area denial? Um, I, I think we'd best describe it as, uh, as complex. Well, okay, that, that's easy. We could always say it's complex, but what do we mean by that? I, I guess what I mean is any, I think any adversary out there that seeks to oppose us knows how we would prefer to fight if we had to. 
I mean, we'd, we'd prefer to stand back and very cleanly, at great distance, launch precision strike because we're real good at that. We have the best capability in the world, and, uh, and that is the least risk to our, our nation's sons and daughters. But because our adversaries know that, I think they are going to do everything that they can not to expose themselves to that. I mean, we've had recent experience with that. Um, I think the uh, Israel experience uh, with Hezbollah kind of gave us a flavor of that. Um, I think that adversaries will employ hybrid strategies and tactics to try to counter our strength. And by, hybrids, by hybrid strategies and tactics, what I mean by that is, you know, rather than, no, no one wants to go us tank on tank, you know, my beloved tank is, I don't think no one, anyone wants to do that. Um, so perhaps they will do, um, you know, be without uniform, and not only will they use unconventional stuff like IEDs, but these ununiformed, irregular type adversaries will also use very sophisticated anti-tank missiles, um, air, uh, anti-air missiles. So it's, it's a mix that we, I tried to come up with a spectrum, but I don't think it's going to be a spectrum of simplicity. I think it's a jumbled mass of complexity, of criminal elements, of irregular elements, of perhaps uniformed elements with all kinds of weapons and capabilities that they can take advantage of. And, and that is, um, that's a pretty scary thought on how we would overcome that. So I think that's the challenge that we have. Um, well, so what? Um, I think the so what becomes in is, is a series of questions. And these things we may talk about in the question and answer period. So one question is, so how do you prepare the Army, the Joint Force, coalition partners, if that is the type of adversary that you may actually face, someone that would employ hybrid strategies and tactics, how do you get ready for that? How do you design your force so that it can, um, so that it can deal with an adversary like that? How do you design with your force to take care of what is most probable, what's possible around the world, even the unthinkable things around the world? How do you take advantage of what we've learned over the last 10 years? We've made great strides in our special operating forces working with our general purpose forces. How do we not take a step backwards? How do we take advantage of the, of the aspect of there's, there may be a domain out there that I'll, I'll, we're thinking about this. I'll call it the human domain. We've got an air, space, land, sea domains. They're very tangible. They're places we operate. But we've learned a whole lot about the human factors of, inter, of relationships among people and among groups. So we're thinking about the idea is, is there a human domain and how does that impact the joint force and our coalition uh, partners for potential futures? And, sir, I think I'll stop right there. I wanted to give you, a, this, is, this is our thought about where our, where our approach is and we're continuing our concept development, um, working on our uh, and we enjoyed working with your team last week on our joint capstone concept. Thanks. Thank you, Keith. Well, while Phil is coming up, I checked the Twitter universe, and uh, Lieutenant General George Flynn reads Harvard Business Review avidly. So it's on the Twitter universe here. Trending topic. Uh, thank you, General. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Schneider and uh, retired Admiral Daly for inviting me here today. A great privilege. Thank you. Uh, thanks both. Uh, I need to stand. Uh, sorry, General Flynn, General Walker, but uh, when my feet don't touch the floor, I only want to be in a bridge wing chair, not in uh, some other chair. So uh, with respect to the foregoing, absolutely uh, see somewhat of the same uh, strategic environment. You know, we're going to see uh, relative instability for quite some time still. Um, the old power structures are under duress, some from within, like the Arab Spring, and certainly some from external forces, the state-to-state -state forces um, that we can't discount. Um, my hope, uh, like all of you, I'm sure, is uh, pluralism and self-determination uh, with a peaceful outlook for the countries that uh, populate the future, uh, but my expectation is to prepare for one of competition and conflict. I can't predict what will happen exactly, and I know that uh, we'll get it at least partially wrong along the way. But understanding the context is important. It gives us context and helps us understand the choices that we have about strategy, 
and then the impact of strategy on our choices. I'm not trying to be obtuse here. I'm trying simply to say that context means choices. And we need to understand the costs and benefits of those choices. And we need to make sure we understand the difference between can we and should we as we try and rationalize the choices we make. So for me, I need to look in the rear view mirror a little bit, maybe out the side, uh, describe where we are just now. I'm an operator responsible for operating and training forces here on the East Coast and then pushing them out the door to the forward edge, forward edge of the spear. Um, and I can tell you right now that the Navy is and remains heavily engaged in the current fight, both at sea and ashore throughout Southwest Asia, certainly in Afghanistan and in the Horn of Africa. In fact, the deployment strain right now for the Navy is as great or greater as it's been at any time in the last 30 years. The Bataan ARG just returned from a 10 and a half month deployment here this winter. And this year we're going to register BMD and carrier strike group deployments approaching about nine months in length. We haven't seen that for the carrier force, for example, since the early 1980s. In fact, the carrier force right now is operating at the same pace over the last two years as we did for the few short months that we surged for the initial combat phase in Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2003. So demand is up. That's an important part of our context. Another piece of context, we're operating in a highly disaggregated manner. By that I mean we're applying much of our aggregated capacity in a disaggregated way. Counter piracy, counter terror, counter drug, BMD deterrent patrols. Right up front, this has put an increasing strain on the cruiser destroyer force. Now, we're mitigating that disaggregated state and we're developing capabilities that we need in terms of Fire Scout, Scan Eagle, BAMS, E2D Hawkeye aboard the carriers, the integration of SOF at sea, just to name a few, to add awareness to the disaggregated force and improve its ability to influence events at sea and at shore, as well as defend itself. And the same is true for the aggregated remnants that remain behind that are still operating in strike group fashion. To be clear, these were choices. The decision to disaggregate, that's one. The decision to mitigate a lack of capacity by increasing deployment links, shortening the time between deployments, or making multiple deployments within a single planned fleet cycle while sacrificing some modernization and maintenance, that's another choice. The decision to add capability for the fight of the last 11 years, as General Wood mentioned earlier, and to take risk in existing capability or existing capability and capacity to pay for that investment um, needs to be acknowledged. That's again a choice and something that has to be part of our context. I want to paint an example for you there. There's no better example than the P3 force in the United States Navy, an icon of a blue water force. On the 10th of September in 2001, we had just about 150 P3s whose air crews spent twice the amount of time training in anti-submarine warfare than they did in ISR. They had twice the experience base in ASW execution than they had conducting ISR missions. Since then, the P-3 force has principally flown overland missions. The effect? The, the exact opposite set of numbers, worse even. Now we have a force with three to four times the experience flying ISR over land than doing ASW. I'll get back to that in just a second. Another factor in the P-3 force is over the last 10 years, we've halved our deployments to UCOM and PACOM and increased our presence in CENTCOM. And the force in CENTCOM performs 80% of their missions in an overland role. So the net effect of all that is we made a choice. We decided to take risk in anti-submarine warfare, in the development and maintenance of nearly a generation of P-3 aircrew and their ASW skills. To be clear, they were good choices in my book. They were needed for the current fight. But these choices, as I just stated, were not without cost and impact. What do I mean? Let me look through the windshield now going forward. The Chinese have gone from a 30-odd World War II era, Korean War era submarine technology force to about 60 frontline submarines today. It was a coastal force before, and they are a seagoing force now. 
In China, they have more than eight times the medium range and short range ballistic missiles, uh, about 1,250 total missiles than they had back on the 10th of September in 2001. And they're building a frontline cr cruiser destroyer force, and their first air aircraft carrier has already put to sea for a sea trial. Iranian capabilities have similarly changed. They've gone from a six submarine force in 2001 to 15 seagoing SSK and SSM submarines today. And they've tripled the number of frigate size and patrol force vessels in that time frame as well. And of course, they've built a fast attack craft capability that was at near zero a dozen years ago. So now, the inflection point that General Wood talked about. The Navy's about to come off a CIFLIC or CFAC-driven ATO for the first time in nearly 20 years. That doesn't mean the Navy's coming home, because I said before, the demand is up. And we have a new strategy, as General Walker stated. The new national defense strategy, it's rebalancing U.S. forces to the Asia Pacific. It's intention to build on existing partnerships around the globe, including NATO and others and its requirement to leverage and integrate the capabilities the, the military didn't have 10 years ago. I talked about that a second ago. Again, investments, conscious choices that made, and good choices in my book. And these include both cyber and the special operations capabilities, as well as the ISR I mentioned. I know two, two things going forward from that context. There is no Navy off-ramp, and we have a new context in which to make choices again. You all know the CNO's tenants to put warfighting force first, excuse me, to be ready and to be forward. So clearly, the Navy and its contribution to the Joint Coalition Force will continue to be global. That's a choice, and it leads us to more choices, operational ones underneath that. Questions like, do we swing to, do we surge to, or do we set in a particular theater? Those are perhaps more finite operational choices, but relevant to the overall choice made by the strategy, that we will be a global force. Another choice when I read the NDS, we will be joint. Over the last dozen years, the joint force has been involved in three conflicts, and they've managed to sustain those conflicts and command and control those conflicts a half a world away. No other country is capable of such an effort on such a scale. The choice to be joint will help us integrate the hard-won capabilities of the last 10 years into the joint force going forward. We'll need that, absolutely. The anti-access area denial environment, the blue water military development across the globe, the need for the joint force to help secure the global commons, be they at sea, be they in space, excuse me, space, or be they cyber, will continue to be important. And it'll take the joint force and the integration of the hard-won capabilities of the last 10 years to close some of those A2AD gaps I've highlighted and lessen the operational risks assumed in the last 10 years, like an ASW. We're working on those already. We had a very highly successful bold alligator exercise to, to rejuvenate um, the amphibious capabilities of the Navy and Marine Corps team. And of course, we've made it a priority just in my own operating environment to hold on to JTFX as we go forward in our training. One more choice, and I'll wrap it up. We're going to be partnered as well going forward. Something else that we will have to leverage from the last 10 years or so. We're well down this path, in fact. And in my book, it would be a mistake to go backwards. Um, we're, uh, for those of you who are unaware, we routinely host uh, foreign flag officers commanding coalition operations in the Central Command on U.S. flagships. Um, we're doing cooperative deployments with the Germans, the Spaniards, and the British. Uh, we routinely train in uh, the home waters of the United Kingdom for our ballistic missile defense ships and some of our destroyer force. Um, these are all indications that we will uh, continue to pursue a coalition environment and uh, a partnership that will enable us to execute the national defense strategy. So um, the way ahead for the, the joint force, at least in my terms, and I have to look at this from my seat here as an operator, the Navy's going to be global and we will be joint and we will remain with our partners as we go forward. These again are choices and I think these choices um, will help us mitigate the environment that's that was facing us. So thank you very much.
Good morning, everybody, and it's great to be here. Um, let me start on this. Ah. Is that the right? That's good. It's just, can we just go back one on that? Uh, that's good. That's good. Right. Um, my aim is to give you an overview, clearly a NATO perspective on the current debate that is going on as we speak in NATO HQ in Brussels, uh, exactly what we've been addressing today, what to hold and what to fold from a NATO perspective and why. And uh, so I've really got two points to make uh, to stimulate your appetite and you'll hear I think we're in fierce agreement across all four of us or five of us here. One is really about capabilities, what do we need and why do we need it? And the second is the US leadership of NATO. Is it implicit or is it explicit? What's the significance of the rebalancing or pivot and so what? And does it provide a represent an opportunity for us all or a threat and a worry? <clears throat> so. So the first thing really is the capabilities issue. We, uh, NATO at the moment is in deep consultation about this and it's really a knotty issue. There's something called the MCR, the Minimum Capability Requirements, which is actually ACT, the Allied Command Transformation work, in trying to establish what we need and why we need it in the future. That is producing a series of priority shortfall areas and the top 20 are the ones that we'd be focused on. It won't surprise you, they comprise I-STAR, um, Cyber, BMD, Joint Fires, and Soft Enablers and, and Medical as well, none of which should be a surprise. And then those get translated into targets for nations. But what's really significant is why. You know, what do we need them for? What do we expect in the future? And how do we expect to use it? Now, my view is that there's absolutely no political appetite whatsoever in this generation of politicians and indeed our nations and indeed the next generation of politicians to commit ourselves to another Iraq and Afghanistan, or so they say. And I think we all accept that conflict, as articulated beautifully by Bob earlier, will happen uh, by 2020 if not sooner. But what will it look like? Well, we all hope it's going to be shorter, smaller, and it'll have the maximum international consensus. Of course, it's going to be ambiguous and complex. We've heard that again, if not greater. Um, there will be a fusion, a sort of network effect of warfare, where our high-end technologies will be fused with our conventional forms of warfare. And again, ISR, cyber, special forces, and the key really, the key will for us will be how we weave that patchwork quilt together and what that tapestry looks like and what effect, how we can maximize that effect of getting those, the synergy between the two. Partners, partners will be a given. It'll be a marriage that we'll expect, not a marriage of convenience. Um, it'll, there'll be greater, not fewer partners. It'll be the rule, not the exception. Similarly, IOs and NGOs. Again, they won't be a one-night stand. There'll be a proper marriage, uh, and we must be better at it. But what does all that mean, really? It means that in spite of all that apparent specialized form of warfare in the future and tailored packages, actually, we still want everything, please. We want the full spectrum of capability. We want it's going to be comprehensive, joint, and combined. And you've heard it from our colleagues already uh, this morning. But I think, above all, we need to think, train, and fight differently. And that's, again, absolutely key. And the paradox or the irony is that perhaps if we really do want, if our politicians and publics really do want a specialized niche capabilities where we tailor the force into this small, short, fast operation, actually, we probably need the full capability to do so, not the opposite. But what about US leadership and the strategic rebalancing? <clears throat> Where does the, <clears throat> particularly with, with Asia and Pacific, obviously? My view is, of course, it's an opportunity, not a threat. You know, why 
the, uh, our, the UK Secretary of State, Philip Hammond, has recently said, why shouldn't we be delighted that the largest economy and the most powerful military country in the world, certainly in NATO, should want to, should respond to the emerging powers of Asia and the Pacific. You know, why shouldn't we be delighted and absolutely right? Um, I see it as broadening NATO's perspective, not creating a narrower one. I see it as creating a sharper focus on US commitment to Europe, not the reverse. Um, because particularly in training, and we've heard, we heard again just now how important our training will be in the future. And I think it will shine a light on our European defence capabilities and really make the European members of NATO stand up and, and be counted, as we heard last year from Secretary of State Gates. And most importantly, this must be about engagement, not containment. There's a perception in NATO generally, particularly in Europe, to see this as a sort of uh, the US uh, rebalancing as a sort of adversarial concept. I think it's absolutely wrong. It's the reverse. When I was a, a student at the Naval War College a few years ago, I wrote a paper on China to try and learn more about it. And uh, my thesis was that we need robust engagement, the sort of political equivalent of a good man hug, not a limp handshake. Um, we need to get involved. China, at the moment specifically, has a huge amount of mixed messages from us, particularly in Europe and the United States. And we've got to be absolutely clear and embrace them, not the reverse, and make sure NATO is seen as something which is an, uh, reinforces our alliance, not becomes uh, a, a potential adversary. And finally, the change of this offers, in my view, a change of perspective uh, in the opportunity to transform in two dimensions, the human and the maritime. First, I think we ought to review our military education and training. We should see how we should adapt our thinking to the minds to, of the under 20s, rather than remain straight jacketed in the minds of the over 50s, like me, where we tend to be rather prescribed and formulaic in the way we instruct military thinking and conduct campaign planning. We need to rediscover the art of strategic thinking, especially at the strategic level, uh, ironically, in all spheres of life across NATO, political, civil, and military. We've lost the habit, and we need to rediscover it. <clears throat> it shouldn't be the preserves of the over 50, so again, but include the under 20s. We all know that we don't really get cleverer with age and seniority, just more wily and better at hiding what we don't know. And in terms of relationships, we need to develop better cross-cultural dexterity that produces greater trust and understanding. And, for, and lastly on that list, technology and intellect. We need to think about the balance of investment between technology and intellect. It's been heavily weighted towards the technological side of the equation. Our assumption appears to be that our intellect is an unchanging constant, and, there we need, and therefore, as a consequence, we need to boost the technology to help us think faster, more accurately, and juggle different variables more often. But clearly, that's partially true, but we should, we should revisit the equation of both sides. And lastly, the maritime dimension. We heard from Admiral Phil just now. This prevents, presents us with a huge opportunity with this rebalancing pivot. We've always regarded our deep blue water maritime operations somewhat as a security blanket. But our specialist skills <coughs> have begun to perish. You know, we've taken risk, especially in passive ASW. And it's time to reinvigorate our NATO conventional capabilities here. But the maritime should also exploit the synergy between the land, air, maritime, cyber, and space domains, especially at the boundaries of the joint battle space. Just as the land and air domains have developed over the last decade in Iraq and Afghanistan, the maritime needs to catch up. Central to which is the littoral, which is not, as we know, just about amphibious warfare and boots on the beach, 
but supporting the complexity of the multi-layered battle space and becoming a more active player in the ISR human terrain mapping, soft and long-range targeting areas, for example. Again, just as we're doing on operations daily in Afghanistan today. Well, that's the challenge we're facing in NATO, with the US as our leader, and in my view, we should be an explicit leader, not an implicit one. And now I'll hand back to General Bob. Thank you very much. Song. Testing right. comes. Yeah. All right, good. I'm glad I didn't have to do a robust man hug when you finish. <laughs> that's, that's all I was hoping for. Well, a, a lot of great thoughts, a lot of great thinking. We're going to take some great questions now. Uh, uh, I, I was going to ask a question or two of the panel, but in the interest of time, 15 minutes uh, probably for questions. So if you have questions, uh, please stand and ask them. Um, I just wanted to challenge Bill one thing you or Tony one thing you said uh, about the strategic thinking of under 20s. Uh, outside my hotel room on Virginia Beach, it's clear to me they're only thinking about beer and the opposite sex, and <laughs> that's the strategic thinking. Uh, I'd say under 30s and give you a go on that. All right, we've got questions. We've got people standing in the audience. Uh, please, uh, 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 there's microphones that are being uh, circulated. One's coming up here. Lynn, right back here. Lynn Wells from NDU. For any member of the panel, the issue here is lessons learned. How do we take, uh, if, if we never actually learn a lesson, do we change behaviors? What we get is lesson observed and lesson reobserved and lesson reobserved. How do we take the combination of the schoolhouse and the lack of kind of organizational memory through that we've lost through rotation rates and things like that, and actually incorporate these lessons from the past decade of war into genuinely changed behaviors going forward? George, let me uh, let you try that as a lot of uh, training and education in your background. Oh, the, the, key, the key question, I think, first of all, is uh, I think after any conflict, we had a tendency to, to collect what we thought were the learned lessons. And I think you're right, Lynn, we, we don't do anything with them. We just put them on the shelves, and a couple of, the, couple of years later, we say, hey, I think we've seen this before. I think one of the things that we have to do is we, we are going to have to take a fundamental look uh, at how we develop leaders in the future. And it really is the human dimension, even though a lot of what we do will be enabled by technology, I think a key lesson learned that we have to capitalize after these uh, 12 years of conflict, if you will, is the importance of the human dimension. The human dimension is enabled by technology. So maybe if we just learn that, that it's all about the human dimension. That's why mission command and how we execute it is going to be so important in our future concepts. Because your ability to empower subordinates, your ability to trust subordinates, the ability enables then the ability for commanders, the strategic commander to remain focused on the strategic level, the operational commander focused on the operational level, and the tactical commander focused on the tactical level. Even though the strategic leader could dial into the fire team and help out that fire team leader, it doesn't mean he should. So even though we have the systems, if we're going to operate at the speed of the problem and the speed of the demands in the future, we're going to have to discipline the force. We're going to have to empower leaders. We're going to have to develop trust. And uh, we're going to have to train leaders to understand, even at the tactical level, that they do have strategic implications. So it's all about mission command, uh, changing command and control of mission command, and truly uh, trusting and empowering our young leaders, which I think is the key takeaway from the current conflict. Keith, you talked a bit about that in the human domain and in the capabilities integration work. How do you see that? We, we, um, we, we also wrestle with the challenge. We, we talk about our leader development as a uh, challenge, as a three-legged stool. You've, you've got the training aspect of it, the education aspect of it, and the experiment, the experience aspect of it. And, um, and right now we're out of balance. We are very, very heavy with our mid-grade leaders on experience. But we're real light on their education and training. Our training in the preparation over the last 10 years at our combat training centers is specifically a rehearsal to do a particular mission in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
And I think we will see, and, and, and we are seeing, a rebalance of training for that complex environment that we believe we, we may face in the future. Uh, we're making a deliberate effort to reset the education. There are so much of our young leaders that have, um, it, it's, it's, it's counterintuitive. They've tried to avoid going to a, a command and general staff college or a war college so they could get back in the fight. Uh, over 10 years, there's a price to pay for that in the education of the force. So the bottom line is we, we have to get back in balance and in order to, so how do you do that and make sure we have to change the policies or we have to adjust our policies to enforce that so we can get back into balance and leader development. Tony. Just, just very quickly, Lynn, is, is to yes, endorse all that as well. We've got a, in ACT, we've got something called the Joint Analysis and Lessons Learned Center in Lisbon, which is trying, you know, its job to do, is exactly to do that. Uh, your point is clearly wider. Okay, got that. We've got the processes and the institutions, but we're not learning. We've got to try harder, uh, and we've got to keep pushing those lessons right up front and shove them right back at the nations across NATO and say, come on, and keep nagging, I think, and capturing those, those points from the, from the generals just now. Thank you. I think we had a question back here, Maureen. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Dave Coggins, I work in joint concept development and experimentation for the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, and I've heard some concepts today. I wonder if there may be a clash of concepts. And my hypothesis is, is Cujo on the undoing of JOAC, and does JOAC make mission command impossible? And for those that aren't familiar with some of those, uh, a globally networked system of sensors that facilitates achieving some kind of cross-domain synergy to undo the enemy's uh, anti-axis air denial strategy. That, that, that's a hypothesis. And then mission command, I don't believe it's a synonym with command and control. I think it's maybe more philosophical, a way to enable initiative. So how do we go from a global, centrally controlled type of thought in a cloud down to that JTF commander out there uh, to solve X for reason Y? Is that a paradox? And what, what kind of ways do you think in the near future are you going to demonstrate, test, and, and prove, and really kind of monkey around with this and see how it works? Thank you. Bill, I, I'll give you the first shot at that, Bill. It's a simple question. These are concept <laughs> guys. Ask them. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm an operator. Uh, uh, I'll, just to the point about awareness, um, you know, improvements in awareness to a certain extent, I, I talked about it a little bit, mitigating some of our lack of capacity to be in other places. You know, I think it's going to be a principle going forward, particularly as we, you know, take on the, the national defense strategy admonition to, you know, leverage these capabilities we've developed in the last 12 years going forward. Um, first. Secondly, it is an enhancement. Um, I, I railed on a little bit about anti-submarine warfare, but the fact is that some of these tools that we've developed in the overland flight will be beneficial to an anti-submarine warfare uh, environment. So, you know, adapting that into the concepts, uh, I think, are important going forward. Uh, I'll leave the conceptual part in your paradox to you, to the conceptual folks. All right. Give I'm, it a shot. I'll, I'll, I'll take a swing at this. Um, fundamentally, I don't agree with a lot of what you said. All right. Uh, first of all, uh, I think if we if we had done things in a perfect sequence, the capstone concept of joint operations would have preceded the joint operational access concept. And I, I think that would have given, con but we are where we are in that. Uh, mentioning that the, the CCJO uh, is supposed to be the bridge to the joint operational access concept is really, when you take a look at, you know, not to get into to the uh, taxonomy of doctrine, but the big ideas are really going to be in the, in the CCJO. On mission command, that really is a new idea of, of command and control. And when you take a look at it, it really is the blending of the art of command with the science of command and how do you do it. And I, I didn't say that was without challenge today. You are going to have the ability to connect at all levels up and down. The harder question is when we're pressing on mission command is should you? The fact that a strategic commander gets involved in the tactical operations means that you're not setting the stage for the battle after next. You know, and, and I told you, and I tried to say that it was a challenge, that we have to build trust and we have to empower, and even though we have the ability to centralize this, we shouldn't. 
you know, that's going to go to the operator question is that you, you are going to want centralized planning, but once you get into execution, you're going to want your all leaders at all levels to do their job. Uh, I do believe that uh, this issue of cyber is game changing. It's a new domain. It's a human domain that was created that changes every day. The cyber domain that we have today is different than yesterday. The effect that it has on war fighting is that inflection point. You know, the fact that you, you are going to have fires that are going to exist in cyber, the fact that anybody with access to a computer can do cyber warfare really is something that we have to think through. We have to understand our own vulnerabilities, we have to understand the opportunities it does, and we have to be able, in time and space, operate across multiple domains. We used to do that you know, in traditional domains, but we've added two more, and we've added one that really, the other four domains rely on cyber for execution. So how are you going to deal with that? You're not going to come up with this capability tomorrow and we're going to say, okay, we got it. But it's something that's going to evolve over time, and, and recognizing that, I think, is going to be key. Well, very quickly, I think that the paradox or apparent paradox that you just articulated is actually uh, an extrapolation of what Churchill found hugely frustrating when he was trying to drive Auchinleck in the North African War and the Second World War, in the sense that we, we will always have that. What you've described is a reality. Uh, we've, we've just polarized it even more because of the technological advances we've had. So exactly as, as uh, General Flynn has said, this is reality. And uh, you'll never, ever get away from the requirement for the, the guys on the, men and women on the ground to take, you know, operational, tactical, or tactical decisions that will have a strategic effect. So, so I think we've got to, whatever, however we conceptualize it, there's a huge amount of gray in the middle and we've just got to make it work. Keith, did you have anything? Uh, just a, a couple of thoughts. So, uh, first on that paradox, if I understood your, uh, if I understood part of the question right was about have we set it up so that mission command is dependent on the network? And a thought is to turn that around is the nature of mission command with regard to the art and science, the visualization, the distributed operation is such that should the network fail, that mission command would better enable you to succeed, uh, whereas our you know, previous um, you know, battle command construct. And the other thought um, that, that we're discovering or struggling with right now, we're doing a lot of work on the network. It's our number one modernization priority. And I got to tell you, we, don't, we do not fully understand the implications of the network. Um, what, is, what does it mean to give the individual soldier access to the information on the network? You know, mission command on the move and small command posts. You know, in Iraq and Af in Afghanistan right now, we've got, everybody's got access to tremendous data because we went to Radio Shack and we bought all this stuff. So, so everybody can get it on uh, you know, classified and unclassified. Well, once you put it in, the, in, the, in our authorized equipment, and that you can do it while moving. We, shoot, what does that mean? Um, we're we're learning by doing it out in uh, West Texas and New Mexico right now, and hopefully we'll be able to answer that in a few months. All remarkable questions. I, I wanted to, Tony, leave you with one question of you, NATO and Libya and the operations there. Could you give us just a moment of reflection on the most recent operations? Yeah, of course. The um, what. Before I came to ACT, I was in Afghanistan, and I was worried, I was watching Libya going on, and I was worried that we were all going to pat ourselves on the back and say, hurrah, you know, we couldn't have done it better. Uh, and, uh, you know, then shape, assume that the future warfare is going to be a Libya copycat uh, regime. And, and I came back from Afghanistan, I was really pleased that it's exactly what we have not done. Um, yes, there were good things about our operation in Libya, not least that whilst the US uh, helped hugely in enablers, deliber deliberately did not take a lead role and made, you know, uh, encouraged the, the European members of NATO to do so. So that was a huge plus. The uh, second issue really is that we haven't shirked from the lessons learned. And going back to what Lynn was asking earlier, those have been captured. And there's a huge amount we need to do better, not least with command and control enablers, particularly the enablers in the European members of NATO. So, so um, lots, lots to learn from it. It's not the template for future operations. The, one of the best bits, though, were partners. The fact that we embraced partners, uh, a lot of whom we didn't expect to 
embrace. And uh, so that is that. If there is a shape of the future, as I mentioned earlier, that is, that is the way we're going to go. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd ask you to thank our panel. Well, gentlemen, thank you for uh, such a great start to the conference by advancing our thinking and understanding of joint and coalition operations going forward. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about in those tough choices that you all talked about going forward. And so uh, thank you very much. And we have for each of you a book from the Naval Institute Press called The Sovereign Sovereignty Solution, Common Sense Approach to Global Security. So thank you very much. One more round of applause for our panel.